Welcome. Let me tell you first off how this reading by Kelly Wells will go tonight. I'm going to introduce Kelly and then we will have a question and answer. And after that, Kelly would be happy to sign books. So the books for sale are all up here. Feel free to just make your way up and get yourself a signature and just to chat after the reading. Thanks very much for coming and welcome. I'm Valerie Sayers of the Creative Writing Program in the English Department. And for many years, I have judged the Sullivan Prize for the short story with my colleague, William O'Rourke. William conceived of the Sullivan Prize as an act of solidarity with all the accomplished short story writers out there who face a literary market shrinking so fast it appears to be melting on the floor like the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> it was William's genius to recognize that, hard as it is to begin a publishing career, it can be even harder to sustain one, especially for story writers. The Sullivan Prize, which is named for a legendary member of the English department who published stories in the New Yorker, among other venues, is limited to those who've already published at least one volume. And that means, in practical terms, that most of our entrants are already prize winners. The stalwart Notre Dame Press is our partner in this enterprise, which begins with the sound of William and me banging our heads against concrete walls. <laughs> Picture us facing two boxes full of manuscripts from some of the country's best fiction writers. Summer after summer, we're knee deep in collections we would be happy, delighted, ecstatic to publish. We rail, we rage, why aren't all these volumes already published? And then we have to pick a winner. We two judges have wildly different tastes but an uncanny ability to intersect at the top of our list. And so it is this year. Kelly Wells, the 2017 winner of the Sullivan Prize, is the director of the creative writing program at the University of Alabama and was already the author of three lavishly praised books of fiction when her manuscript leapt out at us. She had won the Flannery O'Connor Award for short fiction the Rona Jaffe Prize, and the Great Lakes College Association New Writers Award. But we were to soon learn that these awards did not give her any sense of entitlement or even, apparently, any expectation. William wrote to tell her she'd won, and since he's a literary sort of guy, he wrote her a letter. You remember letters? Goes in an envelope, through the mail, not the ether. <laughs> we waited to hear back. No answer. We waited some more. Finally, William called up Kelly and learned that she had set the envelope aside because, slender as it was, she figured it was the rejection notification, <laughs> thereby providing us with the most modest writer we've ever contacted and maybe the best confirmation that this series is absolutely necessary. If you look up Kelly's website, and I hope you do, Kelly is spelled I-E, you will discover first that she's an Olympic track and field star <laughs> and that you should be Googling Kelly Wells writer. <laughs> then you will find the correct biography, which begins thus. Kelly Wells, nay Ingeborg Tromsklaff, was born by flickering lamplight on an inclement night in 1872 <laughs> in the village of Rocken by Lutzen. Her father, a struggling cobbler with thin-fingered, prematurely arthritic hands that were knobby and gnarled as the feet of a recumbent chicken, made and repaired only left shoes and always longed for a life on the German stage. As you see, this is not a writer drawn to biographical conventions or, for that matter, realism. Kelly Wells is a fabulist, a fairy tale inverter, a punster, a sleight of hand trickster, a literary magpie and mockingbird. Her stories are peopled with goofballs she miraculously endows with great dignity. Hers is a dark, serious comedy, her sense of delight and despair held in precarious balance. 
Her winning collection, God, the Moon, and Other Megafauna, has already received rave, rare, rave and rare advanced reviews. Forward Reviews says, Kelly Wells never seems to have met a sentence she couldn't enhance, a list she couldn't extend, or a story she couldn't send airborne. Kirkus calls Wells a writer like no other. Prepare for magic, allusive and elusive, intelligence and innovative. For those of us who labor in the fields of literary production, we simply call it a joy to honor, publish, and now introduce this sneaky, surprising, completely satisfying collection. Please welcome this year's Sullivan Prize winner, Kelly Wells. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, William, and thank you to the press and um, to, to all of you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to read a, 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 a story from the collection uh, that, that is, a, it's a, I imagine, the life of time. Um, and it's called In the Hatred of a Minute. I think I'm going to take my glasses off. When time was a little girl, she couldn't wait to grow up. At four, no stranger to blood, she got her period. At six, she married a train conductor. Nobody ever loved her so well as the train conductor, except perhaps the country of Switzerland. History, who walked around with warheads and that inaugural wheel and fighting words and a triceratops or two and a golden horde and creation myths featuring a landscape cobbled together from the hips and breasts and randomly strewn extremities of a savage body and the big bang and bombardiers and bad decisions and Stonehenge and the flat earth and its dead partisans and the Vin Fizz flyer and blazing villages and Marie Antoinette and multiple paradigm shifts and the and Oh, and multiple paradigm shifts, and the Bronze Age, and Aramaic, and slave ships, and the telltale iridium layer blanketing the bones of dinosaurs, and the pathological insecurities of despots, all falling from his mouth, had mixed feelings about her. He depended on her, but sometimes thought of her as his bitch. Unlike the train conductor, he was impossible to kiss. He liked facts more than theories, men more than women, war more than peace, the victor more than the vanquished, carrots more than parsnips, and had not been a good father to historicity and historiography, latchkey offspring who raised themselves from a tender age. History does not like to think of himself as a nightmare from which a famous fictional character cannot awake. Writers are all such gloomy gusses, thinks history. They should just leave him out of it, honestly. History, history feels compelled to point out, never did anything without the will and sanction of nettled men. But time, she is always passing, dying 86,400 deaths a day. Time hasn't time enough for fear or grief or knitting or long walks along the beach, woodworking, kickboxing. She once tried Tai Chi, but it made her anxious, as does the soothing music piped into the waiting rooms of dentists. She could grind her crowns to dust listening to that. Time wears a cardigan so as not to freeze. Time has always wanted to travel to the moon in a sleeping berth, rocked to sleep by the rhythmic wobble of the rocket. In the absence of gravity, her bones and purpose would thin, and she'd become more mollusk than sundown, more inchworm than equinox. She'll make that possible one day, discount travel to other planets. In time are all things possible. Time's mother used to tell her after time came home from a long, hard day of being heckled by those geniuses she went to John Dewey Jr. High with. Time passes, they crowed as she walked by, just like gas. That had made her persona non grata in the cafeteria. Time's mother told her just to take it a day at a time, things were bound to improve, junior high would not last forever. Time shuddered at the thought. Though she received the usual training, time does not understand the concept of light years or the evolution and high-octane death of stars, does not understand how she might only be gazing at a memory, at a history, when she looks at the light-spangled sky, at a long, dead brightness, seeing the star as it was a thousand years ago. 
No, she does not understand how it can be true that she's staring at deaths that have not yet caught up with the dying, slow as molasses extinctions that have not yet reached the eyes of the beholder, thermonuclear reactions she authorized years ago. Time looks at the sky throbbing with light and makes herself think. That star is 10 light years away, and though it's now an adult, what I'm witnessing is its childhood. All those dead children hanging in the sky, who can bear to exist in the face of that? Time stops thinking. For time, things happen when they happen, and things are always happening. Time's dance card is always full. Time's sister, Emily, was recently diagnosed with a fatal illness that will cause her body to fail organ by organ. There will be a cure for this disease in the future, some years after Emily, at the age of 16, will have died. Time imagines looking in the sky and seeing eight-year-old Emily chasing the other perishing stars with a butterfly net. A famous man, friend of history's, once said that time was God's way of preventing all things from occurring at once, and this made her feel purposeful, even if she could ill afford to be a disciple of someone who nourishes himself thin as a slip on timelessness. She and God have gone round on this point before when she has urged him to imagine an ending, a grand finale, a way out, an omega. Just think about it, she says slyly, for God thinking is as good as doing. He doesn't seem happy with the way things are going anyway, always brooding, talk about a gloomy Gus. History will continue to bluster about God even after he's gone. God would become glamorous in death, a source of wistful longing. Imagine the teary obituaries, the memorial cook-offs. There would be protests and rallies to resuscitate him. People would plant lilies in formerly sacred places instead of setting themselves and others ablaze. Wouldn't that be nice for a change? Time was all about change. There was a time when God was thought to be dead before his penumbra was sighted hovering over Bucksnort, Alabama. Time has pointed out to God that she is meat and milk of many religions. Without her, there could be no second coming, no ancient of days, no day of Brahma, no dream time, no eternity, no spinning Kalachakra, and certainly no apocalypse or end times with which to harrow the brethren. God is careful not to look time in the face for if he did, he might be fixed in place on the spot. And then where would he be? And when? Time sometimes whispers in his ear as he casts a remorseful gaze across the clear-cut forest of the future, old growth felled and gone. Your time has come. God tries to imagine what would happen to the universe were he, were he no longer its custodian, its bricolure, its brawny doorman, its stenographer, documentarian, midwife, wet nurse, internist, alienist, mesmerist, iridologist, its sniper, its puppeteer. Would it be better off? He's made some mistakes. Not intervening in suffering, for example, as though he were just a naturalist tracking a pride of starving lions, one who felt it was his duty to remain at an impartial distance and let nature do what nature does, which is, eat things. So when that baby elephant comes along, frantically searching for its herd after a sandstorm, all he can do is close his eyes and keep the camera rolling. Yes, that was one rule he regretted. But he doesn't think it's hubris to believe that without him, all motion would screech to a halt, all mass would begin to transmogrify and come to resemble the diaphanous and hesitant radiance that is the creator. And this might not be such a desirable thing. To be cast in his image is to see a ravenous absence when you walk by the mirror. One theologian turned agnostic called God, a little spitefully, he thought, no need to resort to name calling, nothing more <laughs> scornful than a convert to disbelief, a pandemic. And God began to see himself this way too. And sometimes he wished there were a vaccine, but these are thoughts God indulges only once every billion years. Why should he listen to humans, those myths, misanthropic toddlers of the universe? 
and then he tucks them away in the deepest, most bottomless recesses of his unconscious, what those meddlesome string theorists are always trying to lasso, and now he bats time aside, which causes her to reel, and in that moment, in that moment, this moment, every sleeping creature dreams of an orphaned mitten and an empty bottle sitting atop a mountain inhabited only by a dying glacier. But then time settles and she tends to the day, her overgrown garden, she weeds the minutes and tills the hours. Your time has come and gone, she whispers to herself. And then the dreamers wake with only a faint residue of the ab abjection of having been abandoned by time, and they slap walls as they walk and drink glass upon glass of water. When time and Emily were children, they played the misfortune and torture game. <laughs> Would you rather have no feet or constantly sneeze glass, a bloody handkerchief always falling from your pocket? asked Emily. Time had a thing about the questionable hygiene of handkerchiefs, as Emily well knew, so the choice was an easy one. And in fact, footlessness, she thought, might be useful in slowing a girl down. She'd been accused of lolloping more than once. Would you rather kill everyone you've ever known and loved, or be the salve the wounded apply to their weeping sores, asked Time. And Emily looked at her mournfully and laid her tiny hand upon her shoulder. Time is everyone's favorite assassin. Time learned to drive and received her learner's permit when she was eight, and she careened about recklessly as if there were no tomorrow, a dream she sometimes had. But there was, and she woke to see snow covering the family Corvair like a winter pelt. It made time long for a durable pet, maybe a Galapagos tortoise, a loudmouthed macaw, something that could at least see her through to the next century, if not the one after that. That morning, she did poorly on her algebra quiz. Sometimes, time failed math on principle. Time feels abstract. Her heart flutters. She cannot see her knees. By the time time was 4.5 billion years old, she'd seen some things. <laughs> things that made even God turn the sound down. She watched as human beings, those Johnny-come-latelys, ate everything around them, leaving behind dental impressions on every extinction. Time was born with a stubborn nostalgia, and she missed the dodo even before it squawked and stumbled gracelessly in and out of existence. Once, time went to her in-laws for Easter dinner, and she ate only scalloped potatoes and Parker House rolls. The train conductor's mother sniffed accusingly and intimated that Time had been packing it on lately and would be wise to watch her figure. Go easy on the starch. She made a joke about the fullness of Time. The train conductor's mother was no will-o'-the-wisp herself, but Time kept her trap shut. She spooned four wizened peas onto her plate. Then the train conductor's mother told Time she had an all-natural cream with aloe and almond oil that might help deflate the bags beneath her eyes. Time had not slept since she was three years old. Preparing eternally for the future can keep a girl from getting the proper shut-eye, but there was no explaining this to the train conductor's mother, who was not a career woman and who slept like a truckload of lead and snored like a jackhammer. Your eyes look like they're packed and ready for a long trip, hooted her husband's mother. Time swallowed a pea and told her mother-in-law the date and hour of her death. And her mother-in-law spent the rest of the meal dabbing spittle from the corner of her mouth and absently plucking cloves from the ham's glazed backside. Later, Time would feel regretful and make her mother-in-law forget though she'd retain a persistent and nagging unease in the presence of time and would always sit with her back to the wall. Contrary to popular belief, time, a fretful traveler, never flies, but she does enjoy walking. She believes it impolite to arrive at a destination too quickly. 
Sometimes even bicycling gives her the fans. When her husband comes home at night after an arduous day of conducting, he likes time to stop and throw her arms about his neck. In this glistering second, nobody dies. Bodies accumulate like corn cobs at a picnic. The universe explodes with excessive human occupancy every day at 6 p.m. sharp. At 6.01, the world suffers anew. When time was 38, she burned her hand on a waffle iron, and now her lifeline looks like it's incarcerated, and it makes her miss her father, who had burnt waffles for her and her sister once while on weekend furlough, the only bread they ever broke together. Time heals slowly, so slowly, more slowly than you might imagine. Truth is, time and God dated for a short time, when time was in college. She never told the train conductor about this, as he already suffers from feelings of inadequacy, and he needs to be alert at work, not measuring himself against impossible standards, for heaven's sake. This was when time was a contortionist, mostly on weekends, bendable as a whip of licorice, how she put herself through school. Budding physicists paid good money to watch time bend, watch her gyrate behind glass or dance on their laps. They tried to coax her to talk about how she started, how a nice girl like her, and sometimes she told them a story, both true and not, as all stories are, about a broken home, father in and out of the slammer, a mother who worked double shifts at the cog and fob factory, and a little brother with a mysterious illness who could never go out in the sun, who played alone in moonlight as other children's eyes quivered with dreams. The physicists sobbed as they dandled time on their knees and stroked her silken cheeks, tried to think of a way they could save her from this sordid life, deliver her from these unfortunate circumstances, and then the curtain fell. One of the many problems that doomed time's romance with God was that he was never on time, and no amount of couples counseling, to which he invariably arrived late and full of breathless excuses, he made it clear he just wasn't comfortable talking about their problems with a stranger. Oh, and that was another problem, God's passive aggression. The Old Testament days of God, then in his adolescence, blowing his stack and drowning the universe at the faintest aggravation, those days were long gone. And though time was grateful for this, weary as she was of starting over and over and over again, still she wished she'd, he'd learned to express his anger more directly and to compartmentalize less. That, she thought, had begun with enumerating the deadly sins, between which time thought there was a lot of overlap, whether God saw it or not. <laughs> Gluttony, for example, just another species of lust. Am I right? She asked the therapist. No amount of therapy would ever make God punctual. Just ask those mopey, sad sack millenarians. <laughs> God complained that he could hear time ticking at night, like a bomb set to detonate upon sunrise, and it kept him more awake than usual, doubly omniscient, when what he really craved was a little ignorance, a little amnesia, so he stopped staying over. Time, at her most lithe and flexible, supple as string, the physicists had said admiringly, used to lie awake at night, worrying about the paradox of time travel and auto-infanticide. What if she traveled back in time and killed herself? Many braggarts had claimed to kill time, had claimed to waste her. She was forever getting death threats, but here she was, still kicking, no bucket in sight, the sun going up, the sun going down. And then that would mean that she would never have existed, which would mean she never traveled back in time in the first place. Indeed, there'd be no time in which to travel had time been aborted in the womb. So, er, wait a minute. It was at this moment that all sleeping people dreamt of the maudlin faces of handless clocks and woke up feeling so fatigued they realized it was actually the day before yesterday and took a slug of NyQuil so they could make it through the night to reach tomorrow one more time, eye teeth and pie-in-the-sky aspirations more or less intact. 
God tried to explain to time the Novikov self-consistency principle, but there was such an air of superiority in his tone as he maundered on and on <laughs> about many worlds and quantum suicide and the mortality of cats kept in the malevolent boxes of theorists and a man who becomes immortal, shooting himself again and again with a loaded gun that refuses to fire, la la la, that she set the phone down and scrambled some eggs. <laughs> she did the dishes, made a grocery list, cleaned out the crumb tray of her toaster, and picked up the phone again in time to hear God say, will I see you later? In the hospital room, Emily is surrounded by wheezing machinery and the usual life-sustaining drips, and she tells time that she understands now what it means to be alone. But sometimes she imagines the tubes are tunnels through which a tiny civilization passes in and out of her body on their way to and from their jobs, the opera, the bank, their homes, each twinge of pain, a pileup, on the highway that leads to a failing interior, a torture she remembers from long ago, and then she understands that it is she who is lying in a room that dwells in the body of another, and she feels suddenly molecular and weightless, as though her skin were turning to starlight, and she is less afraid. It's not that time can't cry, it's that she's crying all the time but nobody sees it. Her sorrow, the sad set of her mouth, the smudge of despair beneath her eyes, are invisible to others, announcing as they do the coming of loss and loss and loss, and that's her misfortune, her Cassandra torture. Time says, we'll always have me, Em, and Emily touches the place on Time's chin from where the invisible tears drop and says, that's just what I don't have, and her mouth tries to smile. On God and Time's first date, they went to a slasher film, God's Choice, and God <laughs> gasped five seconds before every out of where chop of the ax, out of nowhere chop of the ax. A man sitting in front of them turned around and glowered at God, who smiled apologetically, and then, midway through the movie, the man made a show of springing from his seat, throwing a snarl behind him, and stomping up the aisle. Agnostic, God whispered to Time <laughs> and shrugged. When Time told God she thought it was better if they were just friends, God called her a cruel mistress. God knows God was used to rejection, but he'd expected more from time. He whinnied like a horse and balled his hands into fists. The floor began to tremble, objects hopped off shelves, and then the gathering squall in his eyes passed, and he promised to work on his shortcomings, or longcomings, whichever were more irksome. He changed, he promised. But time said she didn't want him to change, and that she knew there were plenty of people in the world who loved God just the way he was, warts and all. God sighed so windily that time fell backward, and all of a sudden, there was Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> whose drawn face looked like molten tallow, and Marie Curie, blinking amidst the glow that trailed her. There they were, standing in the room between God and time, looking a little shopworn and dispossessed. History, who hated it when someone speculated what Genghis Khan and Mary Magdalene and Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek and Tutankhamun and Harriet Tubman would say to each other if they time-traveled and ended up discussing the important questions of the day over dinner, snorted contemptuously. Time picked herself up and marched forward, and when she did, Abe and Marie flew bassackward out the window like balloons suddenly unstrangled. Shortly after, history, an opportunist, saw his chance and asked time out. Time said, it's over between us. And history said, but we've never been together. And time said, see? <laughs> Some weeks later, history thought of a clever comeback. So he phoned time up and said in a fleering tone, one person's past is another's future. But somehow it didn't sound quite as devastating as it had when he practiced it in the mirror. <laughs> and he quietly replaced the receiver in the cradle and considered giving space a jingle instead. History, 
was always trying to fatten time, and time was always trying to rewrite history. At the moment that this happened, everyone sleeping dreamt they were eating vanilla ice cream made by a ball bearing manufacturer, and with every lick, they chipped their teeth. After God, time dated a doctor with a God complex, and they had all the same problems, though he was a little easier to break up with. Time waits for no man, is that how it is? He spat at her between belts of bourbon. A hundred years after Time's sister died, Time thought she saw Emily sitting in a sidewalk cafe, drinking an iced drink and eating a sandwich in a way that looked very familiar. But the closer she got to her, the more difficult it was to see her, until Time was standing before a table that appeared unoccupied. Time had often thought of asking God if he could bend the rules for her, if she could just once hold Emily's hand again in hers, only for a second. But she knew he'd never agree to it. What few people knew about God was that he is secretly frightened of ghosts, holy or otherwise. The previous month, two significant things had occurred. An inoculation for the disease that killed Time's sister was developed, and a temporal cosmonaut in Russia traveled back in time to visit Peter the Great. Upon the cosmonaut's return to the present, he brought with him a lock of hair that DNA evidence confirmed had indeed been plucked from the head of the Tsar. But then strange things began to happen. 10,000 hirsute men living in St. Petersburg all went suddenly bald on the same day. The blue diadem butterflies of Senegal refused to flap their wings and began to disappear. And a global potato famine prompted a run on sugar beets and a series of mysterious garretings on trains traveling to the Urals, which later became known as the vodka murders. Time, who can, when she wants, sprint faster than the naked eye can see, swiped from a research lab a syringe full of the vaccine for her sister's disease, and she found the cosmonaut and ordered him to take her back to her childhood, which he was all too happy to do. He was her biggest fan. He knew her work backward and forward. Did she know how long he'd been waiting to meet her? Oh, of course she did. He laughed and reddened. She asked him to take her to a summer night when she and her sister were chasing fireflies in the backyard, and there time suddenly was, the tire swing twisting on its rope beside her, and there was Emily, holding a blinking net in the air, catching the light she hoped to tame, and time held Emily's other hand in hers, and it felt cool and smooth, like a decorative soap. Emily smiled, then time quickly jabbed the needle into her sister's eight-year-old arm, but when she did, that simple felicity time so loved to see slid down Emily's face like rain on a window, and time's clothes began to unravel and fly apart at the seams, and the earth growled like a large dog and raised its hackles beneath them. And then God suddenly appeared, very suddenly, which always gave her the Jim Jams and had been another bone of contention between them, and he sprayed time with dry ice and froze her in place. He gently moved her hand, careful not to break it off, so the needle withdrew from her sister's arm, and then he exhaled a thawing shirako, and time stirred. But she was so startled to see God standing next to her radio flyer wagon, she stabbed the needle into his abdomen and pressed the plunger. Turns out, the vaccine for Emily's disease was also an antidote to divinity, and God shrank to the volume and dimensions of a boy and ran through the hedges, and a faint, unidentifiable din shook the air, and bridal bliss calla lily sprang from the patch of earth on which God had been standing. God was never seen by time again. Time began to wobble, and Emily was no longer beside her, and she thought, the future is not what it used to be. It had been altered, and she felt an absence open up in her own history, a revision, a loss. But then she looked at the night sky, as she often did, to bring her out of the spins, and this is what she saw. She saw the winking death 
that is Emily, that long ago extinction that is burning bright evidence of a stratospheric future, and she felt less afraid. When God grew up, he did what he'd wanted to do since before he could remember. He engineered and conducted trains, a beautiful orchestration of brute movement, which is how he'd always imagined God, had there been one. When he came home at night, he kissed his beautiful wife, and for that tender eternity, the spheres orbited and sang. All sleeping people dreamt they hung by their feet, suspended from a well-meaning hand the size of the moon, and then the world stopped bleeding, and time felt animal and blameless, a little less fatal, if only for a moment. 